Um, welcome to um, my presentation. This is going to be on a code of ethics for threat hunting, incident response, and security teams, which I think most of us here are part of, or we are at least affiliated scum, as they say. Um, and uh, oh, right. So who am I? My name is Tom Millar. I'm currently a senior advisor in uh, the vulnerability management part of the CISA Cybersecurity Division. CISA is a relatively new agency in the United States federal government. Um, it has been around in one form or another for about 15, 16 years, but it only recently got legislated into existence as CISA, um, November of uh, 2018. So we just, we just turned one years old. Uh, uh, prior to the formation of CISA, I worked at US CERT for 10 years. US CERT is not the one in Pittsburgh, that's CERT CC. Hi, Jono. And um, uh, I was here in 2017 talking about professionalization of the people who do the kind of business that we're all in here. Uh, network defenders, data defenders, system defenders. And I am a member of the first ethics special interest group, which we'll get to in just a moment. Yeah, first. So what is that? First is the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams, which is partially where I stole the THIRSTY um, acronym from. THIRSTY is trademark me, by the way. Um, founded in 1990 after a couple of worms tried to break the entire internet, such as it was back in 1990. Um, and it started out as five teams in the United States, and now it's over 500 teams. It's like 516, I think, last I checked, um, in, over, in 94 countries all over the world. Um, it has the work in first, uh, other than holding events around the world for capacity building, education, training, and knowledge exchange. The work in FIRST is done in special interest groups, which can be devoted to sort of the development of standards, such as CVSS, which some of you are familiar, uh, familiar with. Uh, Jono's talk yesterday referenced it quite heavily. Um, and people complain about it all the time, but it is what it is. Um, and. Uh, also working groups devoted to sort of like advancing the profession in other ways, like sort of like just basically how do we share indicators better, for example. Um, and FIRST is gradually growing into uh, a real professional organization for its member teams. It now participates in the Internet Governance Forum, and it participates in the UN's open-ended working group on to develop cybersecurity norms in peacetime, which... Uh, basically would be a way to, for states to govern how they're going to behave with one another in cyberspace. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because it's all very important in the context of professionalization of what we do. Um, and that's what I talked about in 2017. In 2017, I came here and basically ranted for my 30 minutes, or what was it, 45? I don't know. I, wa I wandered out into the audience, and we just had an open ended discussion about this, which is why I say I ranted, but it was really uh, everybody ranting um, by the end of it. But in 2017, I came here to express sort of like my disappointment in the fact that we didn't really have anything resembling a professional association for people who do network and system defense. Uh, a professional association is valuable because you, that gives you the uh, sort of the, uh, the weight to weigh in on things of, you know, like GDPR, for example, right? Um, to say, like, hey, this is going to break the way we do certain things. This is going to hurt the way we defend people. Or this is, the not, this is not the right way to protect users from the various threats that we all know about and deal with on a regular daily basis. Um, it serves as a foundation for uh, solidifying expertise, it serves as a foundation for trust, most importantly. A professional association is how you know that, well, yes, there will always be quack doctors, and there will always be crooked lawyers, and there will always be sketchy accountants, but by and large, you trust those people um, with, your, uh, with your accounts, with your legal concerns. Um, in the case of veterinarians, for example, you trust those people with your pets, data or otherwise. Um, and uh, 
Should I make like inside jokes that relate to other talks? Because that's going to be hard to follow on YouTube, I guess. If you just like if you just like watch this one, you're not going to understand what I'm talking about. I'll stop doing that. Um, jawbreakers. Uh, so. After 2017, I got the incredible opportunity to go and write a thesis on professionalization of cybersecurity folks. And I got to do some research and I read up on the sociology around professions. And so it goes all the way back to like this guy Hall wrote this um, paper back in 1968 saying these are the, this is the scale of uh, professions and how people feel they belong to a profession and what really matters about being a member of a profession that you have a professional association, that your you know, service to the public is part of your duties, um, that self-regulation, meaning that the profession like, basically like governs its own behavior. It's not governed by others outside of the profession who don't know what they're talking about. Um, a sense of calling, which is ambiguous in 1968, so who knows. Um, and autonomy means the you know, people in the profession sort of like govern their own behavior as well. It goes hand in hand with self-regulation. Then there's a guy named Andrew Abbott who wrote a, a massive book that I read most of. And um, in 1988, and this is a landmark thing. It got all kinds of awards for sociology or something like that. Not that that's especially uh, pertinent to this crowd here. But um, he described the series of events that occur in the development of a profession. And again, it's like you know having a professional journal, right? Like uh, the Lancet, for example, in medicine, or you know having professional examinations, like the PE, for those of you who are familiar with engineering degrees. Um, governmentally sponsored licensing legislation. Again, the PE is a great example here because that's explicitly tied to being able to call yourself an engineer in many jurisdictions, including all 50 states. Um, professional association, which again calls back to Hall. Ethics code which we're going to talk about for the entire rest of this talk. Um, professionalist school, which is to say like you actually go to a school for law or medicine or something like that after you get done with your regular whatever. Um, University-based professional education, pre-law, pre-med. Um, accreditation of schools, meaning the professional association actually says these are the places where you can go to learn how to do these things. The important part of Abbott's events and what he discovered through his research and writing this book that I'm building off on, on top of is that these things don't have to occur in any given order, which probably means I shouldn't have numbered them on this slide, but whatever. Um, the, these things can happen sort of stochastically, right? Like they, you know, like the ethics code can come out before anything else. The professional journal can evolve organically before any of the other things are, uh, are made available or exist governmentally sponsored licensing legislation can be the very first thing, which is actually what happened for American engineers uh, in Wyoming in like the 1900s or something like that, but that's a long story for another time. So what we're talking about today is Ethics First. Uh, it was developed by First, hence the name, and it is what it says on the slide, which I'm not going to read to you because that is a bad practice. These are the duties in Ethics First. We're going to go through these um, pretty quickly. And um, real quick, I'm going to ask you all, if you're on your laptops or on the Slack or whatever like that, I sent around uh, right before the conference a link to Ethics First. But if you just Google Ethics First um, on whatever, you can actually read the document and follow along as we're going through this. And it will have much more wordy definitions and explicit definitions of the things we're going to cover on the next few slides. That's just a pointer for everybody. Um, and let me know if anybody has trouble like finding that on Google. Anybody? Everybody found it? Great. Awesome. I'm sure everybody's following along. A lot of these, by the way, are things that we all sort of like know that we should do already. So it's kind of like, uh, I, 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 I'm going to say we're going to win like the Ig Nobel Prize for a lot of this stuff because it's sort of like everybody knows these things should be done, but we're putting a lot of them on paper for the first time to say like, no, absolutely, you should do these things. This is part of your ethics. And we'll get to sort of like what kind of empowerment that engenders 
uh, later on in the talk and during discussion uh, when we have question time. Trustworthiness, behave predictably, right? That is to say, when somebody shares with you TLP red information, you're not going to just sort of like spam it to Brian Krebs, right? Don't, you know, don't act out in a way that's sort of like, like makes other people unable to trust how you're going to behave in a certain situation. Only make promises you can keep. Assume good faith. Uh, trust on first use. Transitive property of trust. As I say, like, if you are on a mailing list with a bunch of other people, assume that they've all got vouched in and assume that you can trust those people. Um, this could be incredibly empowering if we actually stuck to it. But again, since we've never written these things down, we haven't necessarily been able to like believe that other people would follow them per se. Coordinated vulnerability disclosure. This is one of my uh, faves. I, um, as a member of the working group, I pitched hard for this to, uh, to be included. Um, yesterday's, uh, yesterday's a pretty good example um, of why you should try to do this at all times. Um, yesterday's also a good example of why it's sometimes tricky because you can, in, some, in many cases, you can be in a situation where it's going to be very difficult to do coordinated vulnerability disclosure because of where you work. Yes, I will take inline questions. Is that cool? Oh, sorry, for the video, yesterday was Patch Tuesday. Microsoft released four critical vulnerabilities, one of which was uh, reportedly discovered by the National Security Agency of the United States. Um, the National Security Agency, if you're not familiar, operates in a very, very, very highly classified environment most of the time. So classified information can be tricky when you're talking about doing co coordinated vulnerability disclosure because you're like, hey, I want to have a top secret call with micro Microsoft to tell them about a problem in their products. Um, does Microsoft have the right kind of phones to have that phone call? Um, not always. Uh, so those are the cases where this can be difficult, but it's important to strive to do this. I should also make a point at this, uh, at this juncture that these are all sort of aspirational, as most, most ethics and morals are. These are not things that you must absolutely must do at all times. These are things you absolutely strive to be at all times so that we can all be better and make the world a safer place. Confidentiality. It does what it says on the 10. Um, duty to acknowledge. Um, the duty to acknowledge is, um, is a little bit of a sticky one because tons of certs and various affiliated types of teams around the world don't do this very well at all. Um, we get dinged for it all the time where I work because people will try to give us a tip or tell us something and they may or may not even get a ticket number sometimes. But again, this is important to write this down because we know we're supposed to do it. If we write this down and say like, actually like here's a document that says you adhere to it, then we can start building our tooling around it. We can start building into our training and we can start expecting it from people in a way that's uh, more than do it whenever you can. Authorization, act only when and where you are authorized to do so. Again, sometimes pretty sticky for certain people in certain situations. I don't have a good war story for this one because it's been too long since I did something I wasn't allowed to do. I am a government employee after all. Um, consult with constituents. This is kind of the informed consent kind of thing. Like, hey, I'm going to temporarily break, you su break your stuff in order to keep you safe. Um, but you have to let people know before you're gonna do that, right? That's what we're striving to do. Inform. This is huge. Um, I've heard numerous war stories from uh, colleagues, pro public and private sector, and everywhere in between, about times when it's been suggested that, um, for example, like having like somebody was telling me a story about dynamic DNS the other other day, um, where they saw a lot of people who had been compromised. Um, or at least exhibiting beaconing behavior that indicated they'd been compromised to a high level of confidence. I uh, heard a story from somebody else about uh, audit findings that they were uh, told to dress up to make the company look better. I've been told about uh, people who were told to modify reports, again, in order to make the company look better or make the enterprise look healthier than it really was. Um, 
The duty to inform is to tell people the truth, basically. If it affects their security, if there's something that puts people at risk, you're supposed to tell them, and you're not supposed to monetize it. Um, by the way, that's how you know I'm gonna change slides is when I say a long um. Uh, respect human rights, protect property. I never went to Toastmasters, sorry guys. Um, protect property including concepts and ideas, avoid bias. This is gonna be sticky because this one actually makes a reference to the UN article on human rights, Article 17 I believe it is, um, if you read the long document. And I do suspect that they, uh, given FIRST has member teams in 94 countries and they have slightly different ideas about what, uh, what human rights are from time to time, that this one is going to be tricky. Here's the best part. Ethics codes uh, for professional associations can sometimes transcend the, uh, the local jurisdictional attitudes about things. Um, avoid bias is really important. Uh, just because just because somebody isn't the right type of person that you're used to get information from or that you, uh, perhaps a, a client company or a, um, or a victim uh, institution is not quite who you would uh, normally care about, doesn't change the way you behave. For example, we have, I can say that in the past, and this has not been, this has not been anything recent, but in the past we've had situations where people have said to me like, oh, they're not a real ISAC, right? And it's like, does that mean we're not supposed to share information with them because you said they're not a real ISAC? Like, what does that even mean? Like, we have to share information with them because they have, you know, like there's risk, there's possible harm being done. Um, avoid bias in those situations. Team health, I like this one. This one we almost uh, flat out stole from the American Psychological Association, I believe. Um, but there is a duty to maintain your own sort of like mental and physical health and your team's health uh, in order to respond to crisis conditions. If you, cannot, if you cannot keep your team healthy, so to speak, under normal steady state sort of like so-called peacetime operations, then your crisis response is going to be like doubly impacted. So you have to maintain a safe and positive work environment let people take vacations, um, you know, sort of like make sure everybody can like get along in the office or whatever, otherwise you're going to be hampered. Team ability, actually have a training budget, send people to conferences so they can advance their skills and knowledges. Um, uh, maintain and defend your own infrastructure. You don't want to run a cert if, you know, like this is a physician heal thyself kind of thing about all of this. Um, if you're gonna run a cert, then you'd better be sure that you are going to be uh, protected from all the threats that you're telling everybody else to protect themselves from. Responsible collection. This one probably took the most uh, compression to try to fit on one half of one slide. Part of it is follow the law, you know, obey the rules, follow your retention policies and all that sort of thing. But also, it's don't just park sensors out wherever and just collect whatever you can and then hope that some good data is going to come out of it. Um, this is one that I actually really want a lot of good comment on from this crowd because I know we have a really diverse uh, constituency here. Diverse audience is a better term probably. Because um, for me it's basically like saying like, you know, like just because you know that bad guys frequently use a piece of infrastructure and you want to park some sensors on that infrastructure and just like look whatever they're doing and you know like collect collect that will forever that that's not necessarily the right thing to do the right thing to do would probably be to try and inform the people hey your infrastructure is being abused by bad guys all the time you should probably look into fixing it up and keeping the bad guys out as opposed to using it as a collection endpoint um, but again like opinions differ on that one I'm welcome to debate. Uh, somebody yesterday in a talk mentioned uh, the possible utility of having a shape map for jurisdictional boundaries within the United States to find out where, uh... yes, I know, he's sitting right there. This is somebody, I'm, like, I'm not calling out people who didn't have their talks recorded, man. Spoiling everything. Um, but, uh, 
recognizing jurisdictional boundaries, this is, nobody's going to always know all of the jurisdictional boundaries that are possibly involved. You're a cybersecurity expert, you're not a, uh, you know, you're not a legal expert, you're not a federal law enforcement official in most cases. You should just be aware of them and you should have a lawyer that you can consult uh, whenever multiple jurisdictional boundaries are at, in issue. Um, and evidence-based reasoning, and I guarantee you, after this, we're done and we can start talking about questions and dig into this on a much deeper level. Evidence-based reasoning. <coughs> Basis of verifiable facts. Evidence and transparency. This is huge, right? Um, Ever since the, uh, the Sony hack, and shortly thereafter, when I think uh, somebody, somebody else who is also at this conference, but I won't name them, uh, gave me a, uh, a free T-shirt uh, that said, I went to North Korea and all I got was attribution. Um, ever since then, we have had conversations about the idea, you know, like, you know, like, how are we attributing threat? Why are we attributing threat? You know, like, what is that based on? Can we find out why? This is trying to point people in the direction of being able to say, like, this is why. These are the TTPs. This is what it's associated with. This is what's in the malware that we saw that tells us it's probably these guys. Um, be transparent about your reasoning. That would be great if we could start from that. Have some standards of evidence for what we're doing. Um, and. If you're not familiar with the term rumint, that's like a joke on humant. Get it? All right. Never mind. Man, I'm just dying up here. Uh, rumors, rumors are are not useful. They're 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 often counter-effective to what we're trying to do. And so, why did we decide that we needed to write an ethics code? This is all based on kind of a brain burp I had in Seoul in South Korea at a first conference about four, four years ago, three or four years ago. And, um, and I discussed the fact, you know, basically like we talked about the fact that traffic light protocol that we all use, traffic light protocol is not really legally binding, it's kind of morally binding. And I said, actually, it, traffic light protocol is kind of an ethic, right? It's, you know, like, we, we talk to each other using traffic light protocol and we expect each other to behave in a certain way when we're, like, sharing things TLP, amber, red, green. Um, uh, because we want predictable behavior from our compadres throughout the cyber threat intelligence network defense, the thirsty work space. Um, and why don't we just write that down that you're supposed to do what we tell you to do? You know, we're asking this of you. Um, and again, when, when first was five teams and they were all in North America, this wasn't really a problem because if somebody behaved sort of like, if somebody started coloring out the lines, out, coloring outside the lines as we say, then you could just go and talk to the person at the next meetup and be like, dude, why'd you burn me? Um, now we've got, I don't know, a million people doing this um, all over the world with varying levels of skill and varying levels of familiarity with uh, varying levels of uh, familiarity with what the uh, the rules of the road should be, and um, so we need to write things down. We need to make a document, and we need to try and hold people to it, or at least get people to say that they'll try and stick to it. Um, it's also this is no longer about sort of like your your REN network, right? It's not your research and education networks that we're talking about tipping over because of a worm. We're talking about ICS. We're talking about safety critical systems. We're talking about life and limb in a lot of circumstances now. Um, and it, I mean, this is talking points from like pretty much every speech any CISA official gives. It's like the internet and cyberspace are absolutely critical to all of our lives day to day now. Um, so the people who do the work of protecting that should sit up straight, clean your room, and have some ethics about what you're doing every day. Take your job seriously. Um, and this is the call to action part. What I'd really like to see people do, um, not necessarily at the, well, first, what I'd really like to see people do is read the code, 
think about what's wrong with it or what's right with it um, and tell us at the ethics SIG. Or tell me and I'll anonymize your comments if you so wish and I'll put it to the ethics SIG. Um, my contact information is right down there. So the very first thing is read the doc and tell us what you think. Second thing is after we get comments and we adjust the document so we make it a little bit more perfect than it already is, then I would love to see it built into training curricula. I want to see this be part of education for current and future generations of people doing thirsty work. Um, I want to see it built into tools so that we have systems that make it easier to, you know, like for example, the responsible collection piece, make it easier to destroy data at the right time, make it easier to collect only the right stuff and not all the other junk um, that's possibly irrelevant to incident response work. Um, so training and tools, that would be fantastic. That would be awesome. And uh, that's my pitch, basically. I'm not here to endorse first, although um, US CERT, well, CISA now, CISA is a, is a member of the, uh, the organization. Um, but I do think it's a great community to promulgate ideas like this, especially, again, given the size and the, the community that it represents. Um, and yeah, open for questions. All right. Uh, we had a couple questions drop on Slack, but any questions? Well, let me get the questions on Slack. Um, Frank has a question. Hi, Francis Finley. Um, so, do you see this more as an organizational type ethics or a personal type ethics? So, you gave the example of people being instructed to do things that might be make the organization money. Is that something that the org would be held to or something somebody can say, me as professional can't do that? This is, um, this is a tricky one because of the nature of first where we started drafting this and putting it together. First, the membership basis in first is generally um, is generally uh, considered on a team level. So it's really about the, or it's like the ethics of the organization, not on an individual personal level. Um, personally, speaking as Tom Millar, uh, individual citizen, you know, private, you know, voter, whatever, um, not representing FIRST or CISA, I would love it to be ultimately a, like, sort of like a personal ethic for any professional involved in thirsty work as I so call it. Um, but first is generally like based on teams, and so it's really about how teams should behave. Uh, given the level of turnover and uh, personnel exchange that goes on between teams from year to year to year to year to year, I would say that's not an unwise decision for them. But, you know, I, th I think it's, it's, I'm an incrementalist at heart, so I take it one step at a time. If this is going to become like the professional ethics code for people who do, like, as I call it, thirsty work, then it starts here. And then we'll get it to the point where it's like, you know, like once you, you know, graduate with your two or four or six year degree in doing this stuff, then this is part of your code that you take forth as you enter the workforce. Uh, okay. Uh, so, yep, so my name is Lily. Um, just a quick question. I'm building a, a like a tier three uh, team and uh, sometimes we do get uh, quite overloaded at times because we're small starting up. Um, so I guess my question for you is you, you mentioned like sort of trying to keep everyone uh, in, in good spirits, maybe some camaraderie. Um, things, if we have a stressful week, we kind of like go out and uh, get something to eat <laughs> together as a whole team, or you can take the whole team out, and uh, if it's a stressful week. Um, what other things would you uh, suggest other than like the vacations on time and, and things to keep, uh, keep people happy, but in a really, really uh, overwhelming and busy environment? So I'm probably not the best person to ask about how to keep people happy in an overwhelmingly event-driven, sort of like arbitrarily scheduled, stress-oriented sort of 
Oh, oh I killed the projector. Um, the, um, the reason I say that is because I've been at US CERT for over 10 years and now I'm at CISA. And so, like, sometimes, like, for example, we used to have some of the worst scores on what is known as, uh, like, on what's called the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey, which is basically like there is a group called the Partnership for Public Service to do a big survey across the entire federal government every year, and they find out who is really happy doing their job. And it's like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and NASA always get really high scores because they have a super cool mission, right? Nuclear, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, right? Like, this is like you get up in the morning, it's like, are the reactors safe? Yes, did my job. And NASA, it's like, dude, posted like 17,000 new wallpapers that everybody can download. Um, so those are cool jobs. What we had for a long time was incredibly, we had an incredibly difficult time keeping morale high. I stuck with it through thick and thin because I was like, I fit in here and it's never boring, right? I thrive on that. And I get along well with other people who thrive on that despite how difficult some of us can be. And it's like you, you heard Gotti say earlier in his talk, and it's like a lot of people who are in this business are, as we say, neurodiverse, right? Like we're not all like sort of like cut from the same cloth as so-called normal people, neurotypical people. And, um, and, and it can be really difficult to try to find the right balance of, of what sort of things keep your team cohesive um, and focused and also happy and positive about things, even when it's like the whole world is burning down around you at times. So I, you know, like I, one of the best things we did um, since the formation of our new agency though, is like we started like, you know, like, hey, everybody's gonna go to the softball game. You're just gonna, you're gonna be there to cheer on your team even if you're not part of it. Um, you know, we're gonna do like regular, like sort of happy hour, get together things and Generally speaking, like we're going to focus on making sure our own, I mean, huge part of that is making sure your leadership um, takes care of internal communications first, right? That's always the most disappointing thing, I think, is like finding out about something that your boss knew um, a little bit too late. Um, and if, you're, if, you're, if your leadership overcommits to communicating with their staff, that makes a huge difference. Um, I also got to learn about that when I was at my graduate degree program at National Defense University. We had all these like shiny four-star generals walking through giving us guest lectures and stuff like that. It was a super awesome experience. And nearly every single one of them made the point that overcommitting to communication with their staff was absolutely critical to being a good leader and keeping people positive in the face of extreme danger and terrible environments, right? Uh, so yeah, like, Send out your weekly update to your team. Make sure everybody's recognized for the hard work they're doing. Um, emulate the positive attitude you want to see in others. I know that all sounds like sort of like this sort of like self-help bookie, like sort of like something you would get at the airport airport bookstore, but it's it's pablum in a way, but it's also the stuff that works. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're out of time, but. Uh, yes. Tom, there are a couple questions in the Slack that it'd be worthwhile for you to look at and address. So when you What's sit down. Slack? <laughs> yes. That anyway. Was that was a, I work for the government joke. Yes, I, I, I got it because uh, I used to do that too. So anyway, uh, thanks, Tom. And uh, it's an interesting discussion. We do have to move on to the next talk because otherwise we're going to run into lunch. But thanks for your, very much. I, I think as a continuation of. Um, of a previous talk, which was on the professionalization and, and the further advancement of it, that's kind of the, the, one of the things that we uh, uh, promote or want people to do as a part of the philosophy track as well. So thanks for coming back and revisiting a topic that you covered before. I would like to say thanks to the people who were here at ACOD 2017 and participated in my professionalization talk then, because I did get a lot of ideas from that that I carried forward into my thesis research and that became sort of like the, um, the building blocks for the, this work in some ways. Yeah, so. and, and to that point, there are uh, Google Docs that we will create starting tonight, today that feed into the kind of frameworks that we're talking about. So uh, Tom took our feedback that we created in 2017 and incorporated it into something that he published 
Uh, we did. A Adam shows that that two published, years ago. I was just a, I was just a cog in the system. <laughs> So anyway, but my, my point is that uh, the contributions of the group then feed into something that we will then push out to the best of our ability. So thanks again, Tom. All right, next up, Rich.